Okay, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the next in the series of um, the series of uh, Ground Source Heat Pump Association lunchtime webinars. Um, <clears throat> uh, today we've got uh, Edward Thompson talking about uh, the progression from fourth to fifth generation district heating. Uh, Edward, well known to uh, all of you, I'm sure, as a stalwart of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, um, <clears throat> uh, and with his uh, ISAC's brand has been doing a lot of work in this sort of uh, turf with um, a uh, fifth generation district heat network at South Bank University, um, <clears throat> which uh, which they term a, a balanced energy network, which has received quite a bit of uh, uh, accolade, I think, in, in recent times. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how we go. Um, the series, uh, we're, we're, we're finding that the series obviously is getting uh, fewer attendance at the time because people are now back at work, which is great. We should be celebrating that, of course. Uh, but the YouTube uh, watches have been going up quite considerably, which is fantastic. Uh, the one thing we miss in that, uh, of course, is the uh, is the Q and A, the live Q and A, which is a shame. But I would encourage, and we will be putting a note up with the YouTube postings that anybody watching it uh, in the leisure of their own of their own time uh, can always fire questions in via email. So. If I could um, just ask you to uh, uh, remain um, muted um, during uh, Edward's presentation, um, if you can pop questions into the chat function, that would be great. Uh, and uh, once Edward is finished, we'll start going through the chat. And depending on how we're how we're getting on, we might get into just a bit more of an open open discussion uh, between ourselves because this is a very hot topic. We have. Um, Bay is currently working through the design of the Green Heat Network Fund, which is the replacement, effective replacement for the um, uh, HNIP Heat Network uh, uh, funding um, program. Uh, so this is a, um, as I say, uh, it's a hot topic. So uh, without any more ado, Edward, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, Today's seminar is about um, fourth and fifth generation district heating. Um, and uh, for those who are not necessarily familiar with the earlier generations, it might be appropriate to have a, a look at the history of how district heating has developed and where it's developed. Um, there are a number of different developments over the 100 plus years that district heating has been used, if we're ignoring them. The developments in Roman times and Roman baths. Um, so let's have a look at a, a diagram of the various generations and um, you can see on this diagram that the initial um, modern district heating systems date from the 1880s, 1890s in New York. Um, they were the, the heat source was basically coal waste um, and in these first generation systems it was um, uh, taken to a high temperature, nearly 200 degrees um, centigrade, with steam being distributed, pressurized steam being distributed in concrete ducts, um, which led to one or two problems of, um, of um, safety because um, water under pressure can cause explosions. The odd person died. Um, but um, uh, Mr. Elfin wasn't stalking around in those days, and life was cheap, so um, one, it was accepted that one or two people did die. Um, that was the first generation before the First World War. Um, it moved on in, into the second generation in the 1930s, um, when the, um, there are a number of additional heat sources, including CHP with coal, generating electricity as well as heat at the same time. And um, uh, th this was still a pressurized system over 100 degrees centigrade uh, with um, pressurized pressurized water to stop it exploding. Um, and its key, the key thing is that the temperature was reduced from nearly 200 degrees centigrade to towards 100. Um, this lower, lower heat distribution is important because it means lower heat losses into the ground. And one of the reasons why the second generation was rather more efficient than the first. Um, you'll see that um, as we move forward, the efficiency goes up as the temperature comes down. Now, there weren't so very many developments um, from the 1930s through into the, through until after the Second World War, um, but quite, there were quite a lot of 
district heating systems in the Soviet bloc, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet bloc. Um, and I mean, they weren't all that efficient. They didn't have a lot in terms of um, controls. Um, although, of course, if your flat in Moscow got too hot, you could always open the window and let the heat out, um, which um, could control the temperature, but it obviously wasn't all that efficient. Um, so uh, again, we're jumping from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 70s up to the 1980s when um, uh, Danes became more involved um, and we had a certain amount of um, off-site construction, uh, pre-insulated pipes, um, uh, introduction of more metering and monitoring um, and also uh, a change to some of the heat sources because gas um, gas was being used, gas which of course generates a lot less CO2 than the coal or oil. So that was some, um, that was the progress in the 80s and there was again another shift as we move forward to the 21st century and the fourth generation. Um, again, um, the temp there was a realization that there were heat losses to the ground and one of the ways to help reduce the heat losses would be to reduce the temperature that was sent around in the district heating. Um, from 100 degrees centigrade or 90 or 100 down to 50 or 60. Now, obviously the heat losses will go down if you do that, but there are certain implications of that. And the implications are that you have to be distributing heat to fairly modern buildings with a certain amount of insulation and um, maybe under floor heating um, and quite efficient buildings because if you distribute 60 degrees centigrade of heat water to an, an old leaky building, it's probably not going to get warm enough. So there are so there were certain restrictions in the in the fourth generation. All those the greater controls again um, and introduction introduction of other sources of heat, such as large scale solar and so on. Um, but again, the efficiency is going up as the distribution temperature is going down. Then the key leap comes from the fourth generation to the fifth generation with a radical reduction in the temperature of distribution um, down to ambient temperature. Uh, by ambient temperature, it's perhaps important to stress that we're talking ambient ground temperature rather than ambient air temperature um, because the ground temperature is of course much more constant um, and is somewhat higher than the air temperature in winter and more efficient for heat pumps. Now, if you're distributing temperatures like um, 14 degrees centigrade, um, 10 to 14 degrees centigrade, you do, of course, need to have a heat pump in the individual buildings to raise the temperature up to a useful temperature. But that's a, a general survey of the increase in efficiency as the temperature drops over the 120, 30 years since heat pumps started. So there's the first, second, fourth, fifth, generation. Let's look again at a fourth generation um, setup and a fifth generation setup. Here we go with the fourth generation. Um, we've got um, uh, a central energy center uh, producing, producing heat, probably from a, a, a gas boiler, possibly from a gas CHP boiler, or possibly if it's very modern from a high temperature heat pump, sending out a temperature of um, 60 degrees, so lower heat losses to the ground, to the various client buildings, which all must be quite modern for this to work. Um, and um, that, is the, that is the general setup of a fourth generation district heating network. So we can um, uh, have a look now at the fifth generation. Um, the major, major change um, is the fall in temp the lower temperature down to um, 10 degrees centigrade or something, uh, plus or minus. Um, and um, ISACs designed and installed the um, balanced energy network, which is I think the first fifth generation district heating network in the UK in 2017. Um, and there we have um, uh, the source of the water is the London aquifer. So we had to drill um, uh, two holes down to the two boreholes down to the London Aquifer, 100, 112 metres down, uh, one for abstraction and one for rejection. And it's interesting to note that when we get the temperature up from there, it is always um, 14.1 degrees centigrade. 
That is true in the winter, it's also true in the summer and the spring and the autumn as a constant temperature comes up, which is useful and reliable and better than um, running a water source heat pump from a stream, which can have variable temperature between summer and winter. So here we have the, here we have the temperature um, of 14 degrees um, plus or minus um, going round. And um, you may have a modern building here um, with lots of um, insulation, um, underfloor heating, um, efficient building. So you could, in designing as a heat pump designer here, you would probably put in a heat pump which probably wouldn't have to have a large capacity because of the good insulation. And it would be probably, you probably set it to be distributing water inside the building at about 50 degrees centigrade. You wouldn't necessarily need to go higher if you had underfloor heating and an efficient system. So um, that um, would produce a very efficient heating system. Next door, you may have another building and this one maybe isn't, um, isn't quite so young. Maybe it's a bit leaky. Maybe it's got, um, radiators and um, so the, the heat pump which is appropriate for the first building may not be appropriate for the second. You might need a high temperature heat pump um, which would be distributing temperatures more like um, 75 or 80 um, in order to be distributing a temperature similar to the gas boiler that it used to have before. Um, now if you're sending out a temperature of 80 degrees from your heat pump you obviously won't get quite the same coefficient of performance as you would if you were distributing 50 degrees like the, like the first building, but um, it's probably infinitely cheaper than refurbishing the building uh, with all the disruption and cost of um, putting in a, a, a different system rather than the radiators which are there. So the practical solution is to have a high temperature heat pump. So there you have um, many different client buildings um, and the, um, going back to the, um, the, the energy center, the energy center is not generating heat. It's basically distributing heat from the, from the London aquifer with um, pumps to bring the water up and, um, and send it down as appropriate in order to provide a suitable temperature to the, uh, across the network. So, the essential difference between the fourth and fifth generation is that in the fifth generation, each building has the heat pump of its own, suitable in design to its own requirements. And you may have very different buildings on the network, but each of them can have a heat pump designed to be suitable to what it, to what it needs. And of course, the, each building will be paying for its own electricity, for its own heat pump. Um, and um, so it has a certain freedom, um, which it doesn't have at all on, a, on an earlier generation system. Um, you, can, you can employ it in your own way. And of course, the central organization for the, uh, for the district heating, because it's not generating the heat, it's a much more modest setup with a more modest cost of installing the network. And it doesn't have to, have large offices distributing bills to each of these clients every month for all its costs of um, gas or coal and so on, because it doesn't have the gas and coal. It's a simpler operation and there's a lot more freedom um, for, for the individual properties to do what is appropriate to their circumstances. Let's have a look again at the distribution systems for, for, for third and fourth generation. You may have, um, you may have to dig up the road um, you may have steel pipes to be lumbered into place. You may have to weld them. Um, there's a big operation there. You might have to um, talk to the local district council and the authorities, especially if you're on a double yellow line, because it'll take you quite a long time to park all this into the road. Um, it's a major operation. It's majorly expensive. A lot of capital equipment um, probably involves your going to banks to borrow money, which involves lawyers, and there's a whole setup there, which means that there are very few fourth generation, third and fourth generation district heating systems in the UK. It's estimated, it was estimated in the year 2000, about 2% two, two of buildings are heated by district heating systems. The government has constantly been encouraging people to do more because of the efficiencies of district heating. But the numbers increased from 2000 
to 2010 increased from 2% to 2%. And the increase from 2010 to 2020 is an increase from 2% up to 2%. So not very many of these things are happening. Let's move to the fifth generation. Now this is um, Kale Street in Kale Street in London South Bank University. And here is the road, um, which we were going to install district heating into, going to dig it up and install the pipes, the more modest pipes and those steel pipes on the left. Um, but um, we needed to know, of course, what was in the road. And there were certain services in the road, such as drainage and probably others. Um, so we inquired about that. And unfortunately, nobody had a detailed map of what was beneath the surface. So we had to resort to um, penetrating ground radar to find out, and we did find that there were a lot of services in the road, and it would have been um, a difficult operation to dig that up and to um, insert our pipes and not interfere with anybody else's um, electricity or um, gas or sewage or drainage or anything else. So we scratched our head for a while and then came up with a different solution, which was to install the heat pipes, the heat distribution pipes on the side of the building. Now these are smaller than um, smaller than the pipes on the left. They're not made of steel, they're polymer, they're lighter and they're smaller. And of course they don't require the same kind of insulation because the difference of the temperature inside the pipes and um, the, um, the ambient temperature outside of the air is not very large, so it doesn't require extensive insulation. It is a much radically cheaper form um, of in establishing a network. So let's have a look again at the, um, the balanced energy network, um, because some of these buildings will need heating and some of them will need cooling. Um, so here's the Here's the um, distribution from, up from the aquifer going to the building, the temperature around 14 degrees. Um, and let's say the first building is a, an office block with um, lots of glazing, uh, lots of computers inside, um, and people getting hot under the collar. In other words, a certain passive gain. This building requires cooling, um, uh, not just in summer, but perhaps in autumn and, autumn and spring, and maybe even in winter as well. The usual answer to a building needing cooling is, of course, a chiller on the roof, um, which is a form of heat pump for forcing heat out of the building into the hot air outside. There is a radically better way to do it, which is to have the heat exchange with cold water or water at 14, 15 degrees centigrade. Water has a far higher specific heat than the air does, and it is much easier to organize the dissipation of heat out into water at 15 than air, which might be at 30 or 32 degrees. So this building can benefit from a certain amount of perhaps passive cooling, or if that's not enough, it can reverse its heat pump and transfer the heat out of the building into the network. So this building, which needs cooling, has a radically better um, and cheaper option than having chillers on the roof. That's great news for the man who needs cooling. Uh, the byproduct of this cooling is that the, he's increasing the temperature in the circuit, which is great for the building next door, which wants heating. And if he's heating starting from 15 or 16 degrees um, with his heat pump, he will have to spend less electricity than if he were starting for 10, 10 degrees, which would be typical for a ground source array um, at the beginning of the season. And maybe towards the end of the season, the ground source array might be falling down to, to five degrees or something less. So if he's got an available 15 or 16 degrees, he's going to have a cheaper system. Uh, uh, he'll be using less electricity to heat his building. Um, and Similarly, there's lots of other buildings on, on this network, again, of different areas, perhaps, uh, different designs, all doing things which are suitable to themselves, except perhaps this one, um, who had the opportunity to join the network, but decided not to do so because he didn't want to be involved or, um, or, or wasn't concentrating. Anyway, so he, he skips out. He has more buildings requiring um, heating, and another one, maybe this is a supermarket, with lots of um, chiller cabinets, um, whatever it's food. So it has to distribute, it has to get rid of the heat 
so you can do that um, cheaply into the network for the benefit of the others who need heating. Um, this man is neither pink nor blue, he's purple, and that's because he at times um, needs cooling like in the summer um, uh, during the day. Um, at other times he needs heating, likely to be at night or um, in the winter. Anyway, that as far as the central network is concerned, that's up to him. He's got his own heat pump and he's free to extract heat if he needs heat and to reject heat if he needs cooling. Again, here's some, uh, somebody else who is, needs cooling. And um, you may have um, uh, another one here, which could be a factory uh, with machines and so on in it. Um, machines which might need um, to be cooled down in order to operate efficiently. Again, they can distribute heat back into the into the circuit. And so you might have, if you had a number of buildings on the circuit, a number which needed heating and a number which needed cooling simultaneously. And um, the ones which um, need cooling push out heat, which is great for those who need heating. And the ones which need heating push out cools, uh, which is great for those the other way around. Um, however, I, that's an ideal balanced energy network when you have a balance of heating and cooling, but that is, of course, not very likely to arrive. Um, so that's why, of course, you have the central mechanism for um, distributing, uh, collecting heat from the London aquifer at 14 degrees centigrade to stabilize the whole system. So that is the beauty of having a fifth generation system. It is much more flexible and much cheaper. So um, let's move on again to the fifth generation. It's essentially an ambient ground temperature distribution loop with a heat pump in each building to transfer heat into the building or out of it as he, as he requires. Um, you can take advantage of demand side response because you're using quite a lot of electricity and can get a, a, a good deal with your DNO if you know how to do that. Um, it's important to recognize what the fifth generation does not employ fifth generation system based on heat pumps does not employ combustion. Therefore, it issues no CO2 on site. Um, it issues no um, NO2 um, on site, which is um, good for those with respiratory diseases like COVID or whatever, um, and no particulates either, providing none of the students are smoking on site. Um, so fifth generation offers a radically cheaper installation cost. It provides the ability to recycle heat between buildings. And very importantly, it has the flexibility to expand or contract without major cost implications. So if we um, perhaps go back to this circuit here and it's two years later and the system is going well, um, this man, hears that his neighbors are getting cheap heating. So he says, I've changed my mind. And he goes back to the, the, the central organization saying, excuse me, can I please be connected? I know I, I know I said I didn't want it two years ago, but I do now want it now. Is it, is it possible to connect after the event? Um, and the response from the center will be, yes, indeed, it is possible. We'll make the connections for you. Um, you can get your own heat pump, pay for your own electricity, and uh, we will provide you with this source of water um, so that you can extract heat from it or distribute heat back to it as it suits you. It's um, no skin off our nose, we can do that quite happily. Now that, of course, is a completely different response from what you get for a fourth generation system, because the fourth generation system really has to know in advance how many people are going to be on the network, what the heating load of the network is, um, so that it designs its central um, uh, energy center with the appropriate size of um, machines for the appropriate load. And it would be inflexible and difficult for it to increase the number of clients on the network or unequally to reduce them because if um, uh, two buildings were to go bust and not pay in a fourth generation system the central system would be a losing lot of revenue and it would um, it might be looking to the others to pay extra um, it might um, uh, it might 
put the whole thing in financial jeopardy. But you don't have that kind of problems with fifth generation. It is far more flexible. Um, and that is why it is highly, that's one of the reasons it's highly desirable. Um, another of them is that a fifth generation system can use waste heat at any temperature above its circuit temperature. So if somebody has water, wants to get rid of heat at 30 or 40 degrees, that's no problem. The fifth generation um, network can absorb that and distribute it to the others. If you're running, of course, a fourth generation or third generation where the temperature is 80 degrees is, or 90 degrees, if somebody offers you 30 degrees, you have to say, well, I can't use that because that's no good. I need a higher, if it's waste heat, I need a higher temperature than my circuit. So a fifth generation can use any waste heat at any temperature above, um, above its, its circulation temperature. Also, of course, if you're running heat pumps, you probably have less maintenance in you if you have combustion boilers in a modern system. A balanced energy network can grow in modular fashion. If this is the diagram of the one that we saw before, there may be other similar setups. Um, if they're geographically, you know, if they're close by, there may be advantages of making hydraulic connections between them um, because if this setup has um, lots of buildings which need cooling and therefore rejects heat, and this one is the opposite, then maybe the heat from this one can be distributed to that one um, for the benefit of both. Um, the, more, the more buildings you have on the network, the more likely it is you're going to get a balanced energy network. This is perhaps slightly analogous to the interconnect on the grid systems between France and UK and Ireland and I think Norway coming up, um, where if there's lots and lots of wind, UK generates lots of electricity and can distribute it to, to France and elsewhere. But if the wind's not blowing, the UK doesn't have enough electricity and can import electricity from France, maybe from a nuclear source. Um, this is to the benefit of both France and England, um, depending on how the um, how their generations are going. And again, if you can join up um, fifth generation networks, there can be advantages to all parties. So um, a key element here for a successful fifth generation network, especially one which is connecting up old buildings as well as new and enjoying that kind of flexibility, is you do need to have a high temperature heat pump so that you can Put a heat pump in the existing plant room and issue a temperature similar to what the gas boilers were doing before without going to the huge expense and disruption of refurbishing the building um, and um, having to update the radiators or the other other issues so a high temperature heat pump is critical to fifth generation um, heat district networks especially if you're planning to connect old buildings and you're involving um, retrofit. The London South Bank University, those were of course existing buildings, so it's as a retrofit. And it was part of the exercise which we did as a research project with Innovate UK is that we developed high temperature heat, um, heat pumps in order to be able to provide heating to existing buildings without refurbishing the heat distribution system within the building. And um, a heat pump like this can distribute temperatures up to 80 degrees centigrade, which doesn't mean to say that we would always do that. Um, we do that when 80 degrees is needed in you know, January and February or when it's cold, um, but these are inverter driven heat pumps. And um, if 80 degrees is needed, then we will be dis distributing it 75 or 70, uh, which of course will get a higher COP, um, less expensive electricity. So this is a key to the um, flexibility of um, fifth generation district energy networks. We've got, you may have heard recently that um, the Carbon Trust issued the heat pump retrofit in London document because the GLA and quite a lot of the authorities are keen on reducing their NOx and SOx and um, CO2 in London. London aims to be net carbon zero by 2030. 
Um, and 28 of the London borough, 28 of I think it's 32 London boroughs have declared a climate emergency and over half of them have already committed to achieving net zero by 2030 for their local authority buildings, um, including schools and hospitals as well as, um, as the actual buildings belonging to the, um, belonging to the council or run by the council, such as some um, uh, residential, um, residential setups. One of the leaders in this is Southwark, the London Borough of Southwark. And um, we were engaged by London Borough of Southwark to look at um, decarbonizing their heating. Um, and the best way to decarbonize heating scale um, is get is to get to community heating, community heated housing estates and replace the fossil fuel gas boilers with heat pumps, which engage heat transfer instead of combustion. So in the London Borough of Southwark, um, at three separate um, community housing estates, Consort, Newington and Wyndham, we are installing high temperature heat pumps in uh, their plant rooms for their district heating, for their community heating. Now these are of course fourth generation uh, rather than fifth generation because we don't have a heat pump in each building, uh, we just have the heat pumps in the in the energy center in the plant room. Um, but that um, that is the, um, uh, you, could, you could probably tell from what I was saying earlier that ISACs think that the fifth generation is the way to go. However, if there is existing fourth generation, um, we can improve them um, by substituting heat transfer instead of the um, combustion of fossil fuels. So um, again, a key element of this is the high temperature heat pumps, because obviously these um, networks had gas boilers before um, distributing temperatures like 80 degrees and we have to do the same thing from the heat pump um, or else the network wouldn't be big enough. The three, the three um, housing estates um, in Southwark have a total of 2,150 dwellings and these will all be receiving um, heat without combustion um, when, the, when this project is complete which will be next year. So ISACS is pleased to help anyone who wants to have retrofits and wants to reduce their carbon and NO2 production. And we would be very pleased to help anyone who is in need of help. Edward, thank you. <clears throat> Excellent, very good. Um, nice, uh, simple dance through the progression um, from uh, first to fifth generation heat networks uh, and some uh, excellent um, excellent examples for us to uh, to chat through. Uh, you'll be very pleased, Edward, that questions have been coming in. Right. Uh, so I'm going to try and pick them up uh, as, as we go through, just in the order that they were posted. So there's no particular order to this. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Brendan, who we know well as a uh, member of the uh, long-standing member of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association. Um, he uh, he wants to know his initial question. Lots of questions from Brendan. Uh, why are fourth generation networks not run on weather compensation? Why are they not run on weather compensation? Um, I, I I don't know. It's true that they aren't. Um, if um, uh, if I was running a fourth generation, I think I would be interested to to have weather compensation in there too. Um, so uh, I, I question whether it's true that they don't use weather compensation. I think I think they, they could and they should. Uh, and uh, the the fourth generation networks that you're currently converting, you mentioned those three examples. Yes. Um, uh, are they going to be weather compensated? Oh, yes, they definitely they are. Yes. But are you doing domestic hot water as well as heating there? Uh, yes, we are, because the um, uh, I mean, it's ex an existing system, and the existing system um, uh, distributed hot water from from the gas to the buildings, and they had um, um, HIUs which um, were used to provide hot water as well as um, as, as heating. So yes. So will that limit the degree of uh, weather compensation that you can make use of? I assume it will. I think yes. I, th I think it will, but our function, our function in these Southwark things is to provide heat, to provide heat at eight, up to 80 degrees centigrade 
um, in the plant rooms, we are not involved in the individual dwellings. Um, we are not doing any work in the individual dwellings, adjusting their HIUs or whatever. We are working from the plant room backwards. So we are organizing the drilling, for example, the drilling down to the London aquifer um, and um, up to the plant rooms and um, uh, the heat pumps was, will be distributing up to 80 degrees centigrade. So our, our remit doesn't cover the individual properties mm. in, this, in this contract. So Brendan, Brendan goes on to ask, you know, what, why such high temperatures? Uh, you know, he would typically run his systems at no more than 40 degrees at design external conditions in um, uh, what people would consider to be hard to heat traditional stone buildings, for example, with single glazing. Uh, and he says, you know, if you're going to do it, why not do it properly? Because radiators are cheap. Um, so uh, I, I'm assuming here it's it's not just the emitters we've got to worry about. Well, the good news for good news for Brendan is that if he was linked to a fifth generation system um, and he gets the water at um, 14 degrees centigrade, he will be free to install his own heat pump in his own way to his own design and to run it independently. He will have to pay to have the access to the water, but he will do everything else independently. And that's important because a lot of people like to do their own thing and he will be free to do that in the fifth generation system. So what you're saying there then is it becomes the consumer's choice as to whether to upgrade their own building and their heat distribution in their own building um, and it doesn't actually matter too much to the network itself. Uh, absolutely, that's what I'm saying. And that's absolutely important because, um, you know, people like to, people like to be in control. Um, and somebody who installs his own heat pump is in, in charge of the installation. He's also in charge of paying for the electricity that it uses. Um, and he has that independence and freedom. Um, and one of the key things about fifth generation is the freedom uh, that it gives um, each building on the network. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, moving on, we've got a question from, uh, from Peter, who uh, is discussing the issue of uh, system resilience and redundancy uh, in, the, uh, in the borehole couplets. So he's saying, um, it, if uh, I'm assuming this, uh, Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe putting words into your mouth here, but um, if the heating is, is, is deemed to be mission critical, uh, is it appropriate, and should we be talking about putting redundancy and resilience into uh, into the borehole sources, i.e., using more than one couplet? Um, of course, um, resilience is a good idea, and you may use more than one couplet. Couplet. It is expensive, of course, to. Um, to, to drill these boreholes, I mean, each one is quite expensive because um, they're larger boreholes than for uh, in, in installing a probe. Um, but um, we do have resilience in these systems um, and um, both at London South Bank and in the Southwark generally, because the resilience comes from the fact that although we've put in the heat pumps, we haven't taken out the boilers. So if for some reason our heat pumps didn't work, and the controls, which we've also installed, would go to the go to the gas boilers and turn them on, and there would be guaranteed heating unless the boilers also failed. So there is lots of resilience in the system designed in from scratch. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So using using fossil fuels as your failover rather than um, uh, relying on being able to keep the heat pumps running, which is perfectly you know perfectly valid and perfectly viable uh, where you've got a gas network. Um, uh, a bit more of a problem for people who are running uh, running oil out of town, I guess. Uh, yeah, but on, on, on resilience, um, uh, obviously, when you when you install um, uh, abstraction and rejection um, boreholes down to the aquifer, you don't know. Um, I mean, you do your calculations and you estimate what you're going to get. But when you've done your boreholes, you don't necessarily get what you hoped, um, and you might have to indulge in. Um, um, acidization to improve the, the fissures in the chalk um, to get a sufficient um, water volume of 25 or 30 litres a second, um, whatever it is you're aiming for. Um, but once you've got that established, um, then um, I think you will find that it's very, very solid and very reliable. Um, 
there's, there's, there's costs of getting there, uh, but once you've got once you've got that kind of access, it's probably going to it's probably going to be maintained. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, I, I suppose that the concern here is from certainly from my perspective uh, would be not so much the boreholes themselves, it's more the submersible pumps. Um, because, of course, I, I don't believe there's any such thing as a twin head submersible pump at the moment. Okay, uh, that, that that's true. Uh, that's true. And of course, if you had um, if you had two two couplets instead of one, um, then um, you would have a more resilient system. But it would cost you a bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think it, it's the, the key here is to spell out to the consumer, isn't it? The uh, the relative advantages of cost versus degrees of risk that they're entertaining. And as long as they've got some sort of failover, even if it's fossil fuels for a limited period of time, then that's fine. Yeah. Um, so Robin has made the point, of course, that that comes with planned maintenance for the uh, for the submersible pumps. You're absolutely right, Robin. Having a planned maintenance program is is essential. Yes, um, I agree. Uh, one of the questions, obviously, you're doing this. You're you're applying for licenses from the Environment Agency um, at the moment. Um, in, in these instances, Edward, what uh, what length of licenses are the Environment Agency issuing in London at the moment? Um, the, we already have the permission from the Environment Agency because we, we've done that with them. Um, I didn't do it myself, so I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. But um, we have found that the Environment Agency are, um, I mean, that there are scientists there. If you, um, if you address their questions um, um, in the way that they ask them, um, we get on very well with them. Um, and they're reasonable people. And um, they probably want to give permission, um, subject to their, you know, checklists and so on, which are all very reasonable. So um, we haven't come across problems that we haven't solved with the with the Environment Agency. Yeah, I was thinking not so much the the, the issues of getting a license in the first instance, but the licenses are always are always timed. Uh, I was just interested to know what what length of license they were currently issuing in London, because uh, at one point there was talk of the length of those licenses, the duration uh, coming down a bit. Um, and I don't know whether that was still the case. Um, I think the last one that I did was actually some while ago myself, because obviously I've not been contracting now for uh, over four years. But um, uh, I think at that point, we got the license was timed out to about 2028. 20, so it would have been about 15, 16 years or something. So you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> and, and there's always that risk at the back of your mind when you, when you have that situation that, oh, are they going to renew this license? Uh, you know, well, I think um, it hasn't come up um, with my colleagues as an issue, um, and the environment agency is, is keen on saving carbon. Um, if these systems run well for ten years, I can't imagine that the environment agency wouldn't want us to continue. Mm. No, I, I agree. Would, I, I would say not. I, I absolutely agree, Edward. Um, so uh, Brendan's come back and he says. Uh, what sort of seasonal performance factor are you expecting from your high temperature heat pumps that you've been putting into these buildings? Um, in terms of coefficient of performance, it's, it's um, I mean, we'd like to say four or more, but in fact, it's only about three because the because of the high temperatures involved. Um, so um, the uh, broadly, broadly more like three than the, the four that we would expect if we were distributing lower temperatures. Okay. And then, so the, uh, the the question then that comes uh, following on from that is, how does the economics then stack up uh, when you're displacing natural gas, which we all know is incredibly cheap? Um, and and if there's no operational cost advantage at the first instance, do you anticipate that that operational cost advantage will ultimately come from an adjustment of the spark gap uh, and from uh, flexibility services. Um, yes, to, by flexibility services, you probably mean demand side response, do you? It, well, that... Yes, and, and getting the value out of being able to apply demand side response. I mean, yeah, it, yes. you know, I, I don't know how much I don't know how much natural thermal storage you believe that these systems would have in them to be able to deliver some element of, um, of flexibility services. Well, in um, in the London South Bank University, we did introduce two um, 10,000 10, litre thermal stores, stratified thermal stores, um, and they are heated at night on cheap electricity, um, and the um, university doesn't use a vast amount of water, 
um, but it's obviously water is used during the day for kitchens and people going to the loo and so on. Um, so um, those exist at London South Bank. We considered them for the Southwark, um, the Southwark um, uh, community centres, but the, the, the sort of thermal store in terms of water would have had to be so large that it wasn't practical to do that in terms of in terms of the, the three Southwark um, uh, community heating systems. But generally, of course, a, a, a building has a certain thermal mass. Um, and so you can heat the building itself at you know, two o'clock in the morning or keep it to a certain um, temperature below which it shouldn't go um, to reduce the need for heating during the day. Yes, yes. And uh, the, the, the reason I asked specifically about the, um, the value of the flexibility services is I was having a discussion yesterday with somebody uh, about the value of flexibility uh, in agricultural systems, very large agricultural systems. And I was surprised. I'd never heard anyone start putting sort of monetary figures on it before, but the values are very considerable. So if we can unlock them, uh, you know, if we can come up with uh, mechanisms as an industry to unlock that flexibility value, uh, then I think that will go a very long way to starting to um, deal with the problem that we currently have, where obviously installing these systems from scratch is a relatively expensive capital cost exercise. Yes, it, it is a capital cost exercise. Um, and if the government is serious about um, uh, uh, decarbonisation by uh, 2050 or 2030 or whatever, um, then it has got to adjust the, take the taxes off electricity and put them onto gas. Um, that, that is recognised in our community, but the, um, the government is taking time to, for the penny to drop. Yeah, well, let's, let's hope that now Boris has specifically mentioned ground source heat pumps in his speech to the Tory party conference, that, uh, that that's something he'll continue to remember when, uh, when he's talking to Dominic Cummings about policy. Um, uh, I think we've picked up most of the questions that were put in the uh, in the chat function. Has anybody else uh, anybody else got anything they want to add? Uh, any other questions they want to raise with Edward in this discussion? Um, please fire away. Uh, I think there is a there's a, a even a, a raised is there a raised hand function. I think we have got a raised hand function in this. Uh, in somewhere. So if anybody wanted to speak, they were to put their hand up or last chance for questions in the uh, in the chat. Um, any closing comments, uh, Edward, just to uh, to sum up? Um, well, I think that um, I well, the, if you look at the recent document and the, um, the published this morning, the suggestions are that the future is heat pumps or district heating. Um, I actually think that as far as district heating is concerned, um, it's only the future if the district heating has got heat pumps behind it, because, um, I mean, there was a theory that um, district heating saves energy because you're getting more of the energy inherent in the fossil fuel if you're using both the heat and the electricity generation. And that was the reason, I think, for having district heating, you know, 20 years ago. But that is no longer the case with carbonisation. Um, and really, um, of the two things, heat pumps and district heating, district heating is really only relevant if you if it's based on heat pumps. So it's basically heat pumps or heat pumps if they're serious about decarbonisation of heat in buildings. Mm, indeed, uh, that seems to be the general consensus coming out now. For the next decade, it's all about electrification, and we just need to uh, um, to get policymakers to um, to start to agree with. Uh, not only us in the industry, but everybody else who's watching the uh, watching the heat sector as well. So uh, yeah, my view is it's not that's not just for the next ten years; it's for the next thirty years because um, I don't believe that hydrogen will be relevant. There are fundamental laws of physics which mean that hydrogen is not going to be used um, in the in the gas network. I can't see it happening in thirty years. No, uh, well, neither can I. I'm just trying to uh, I'm just trying to be um, shall we say a bit more accommodating at this stage. Um, so uh, I think I, uh, no more questions coming in, so I'm going to draw that one to a close. I'm going to say, Edward, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was really good. Um, I'll just remind everybody that this uh, webinar will be posted up on our YouTube channel in due course. 
Uh, there will be opportunities. Anyone can email us with supplementary questions. If you go away, talk to your teams and you have a, a supplementary questions either for Edward or for the association, please do make contact with us. Um, thank you very much for attending everybody. I'm afraid I'm terribly badly organized and I've no idea what the next week's topic is. <laughs> Otherwise, I would flag it. But please keep an eye on the Groundswell Sea Farm Association website. And, uh, and I wish you all a very good afternoon. Thank you very much for attending. And thank you, Edward. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.